And tonight on The Daily Wrap, Donald Trump gets some bad news in the national polls. How bad? We'll tell you. On Capitol Hill, we might just have a budget that will pass the House and the Senate. How bad? We'll tell you. As the war on ISIS intensifies, is it time for boots on the ground? Plus, we'll have your viewer comments. This is The Daily Wrap, live from New York City. And welcome to the show, everybody. I'm Joe Concha, along with Rick Unger. Happy debate eve, it I guess is. you could call it. Big day tomorrow. The Big third in a series of, what, 9,423 Republican debates? That used to be the case. They had 27 back in 2012. What are we, what are we Only seven now? this time around. Oh, that's all it's going to be? Yeah, seven on the Republican side, six on the Democratic yeah. side. And you will have Sarah Palin and Dick Morris, along with Steve Malzberg, with you tomorrow. We right? will have an interesting lineup tomorrow. It should be some some interesting after-debate coverage. Absolutely. Look at that smile. How can you say no to Stevie. So definitely uh, be there tomorrow night. That's right after the, the uh, CNBC debate, which should be very, very interesting. And we'll tell you why in a moment, too. Mr. Unger's right. She is America's pundit and one heck of an attorney. Heather Hansen is here and apparently has access to the teleprompter. And finally, just back from Israel, the editor of the Wisdom Daily and a Washington Post contributor. His name is Rabbi Brad Hirschfield. Welcome, sir. Good to be back. We'll hear all about your flight and your vacation and see the pictures, but first got to get right to the daily download. <laughs> who's the candidate who's the biggest opposition to you? Well, I thought just by the normal uh, chain of events, I thought, and by, you know, history, it would be Jeb Bush, and I guess that's why people said, boy, you've really hit him hard. Why? Because I, you know, everybody was saying, well, he's going to uh, ascend to the throne, like, you know, it's like, like we're dealing with thrones in this country. Yeah. I am surprised at Ben Carson, but I go after Ben Carson. You know, whatever happens, happens. I mean, somebody would say, oh, you go, I don't know, that's my whole life. If somebody is a, an opponent, I want to win. Uh, ben Carson is now doing well, and I think Ben Carson has a lot of... Uh, problems with his record, if you look at his record, including going back in past. And, you know, those problems are going to start to come out. That's Donald Trump today on Morning Joe, as he is almost every morning, claiming that Dr. Ben Carson is his biggest threat. And as of right now, he's exactly right. In the latest CBS News, New York Times poll, Ben Carson leading with 26 percent of the vote. Trump, 22% of Republicans like him. Then it goes Rubio, Bush, and Fiorina well behind. This is just one poll, and Trump continues to lead other national polls. But do you get the feeling the wheels are finally starting to come off the Trump campaign? I only say finally because pundits have been saying since basically since he declared that it would go downhill. But this time, this is tangible evidence that it may be happening. Yeah, except I'm afraid to say it. <laughs> yeah. too. I'm just afraid to say it. Let's, let's wait and see some more polls. This was the first out in this time frame, let's see if it holds consistent. Look, if, if we do see this replicated in other polls, all it's telling you is that the same process we see every single time there is an election is starting to take root. The difference will be that instead of a two week at the top of the poll, he's literally had three months. So it's a little too soon to judge, but not inappropriate to raise the question. Yeah, there was one national poll, but also there were two polls in Iowa showing that Carson That's pulled clear. ahead there as well. So maybe we have a trend going here. Yeah, I think we do. And I think it'll be inter interesting to see how the debate affects that and whether or not Trump goes after Carson at the debate. I think that if the if the debates go as past debates have gone, I think that you will continue to see Donald Trump fall down. I think that he's definitely uh, worn out his welcome with some people. I know that there are some people who love him and will continue to love him and will love him until the, the day that they vote. It's fair to point out that with the Iowa poll, I have to give, give in all fairness to Mr. Trump, this is absolutely what we should have expected. Remember, Rick Santorum won last time around. Mm -hmm. Mike Huckabee won before it that. Away. It's an ev right. evangelical That's voting the base. It makes all the sense in the world that right. they'd be pulling in for Ben Carson now. All right, Bradley. Well, well I think that's down. exactly right. I, you know, don't count the wheels off this guy's bus too fast. I know it's been fun to do. The bottom line is, the really interesting thing is, if he's being replaced, he's being replaced by another non-politician. And the truth is, all the professional politicians in the race added together don't equal Carson and Trump.
Yeah. So the real thing to watch for is in addition to an evangelical base in Iowa and the fact that winning Iowa has very limited predictive value in terms of getting the nomination, is that there is still a deep-seated preference for a non-politician over any other politician. So you could jump in then, theoretically. I'm ready to go. If you guys are willing to back me, I'm, not I'm not willing to give I'm it a shot. Allowed. It's against my <laughs> yeah. contract. I can't make it the contract. It's against his DNA. Otherwise, I'd be there. <laughs> yeah. I'm saying, contractual things we can work out. The other <laughs> stuff might be much bigger. Right. It's inherent. Yeah. Anyway, Ben Carson has one thing going for him, favorability. In the latest Quinnipiac poll, Carson has a whopping 84% favorability rating among likely Iowa caucus voters. Heather, should Ben just say hey? I think that he just needs to maintain his, his tone. I mm -hmm. think that he's, his favorability is not because he does not strike back, because I think he does, but he does it in a very gentlemanly, kind, not bombastic way, as opposed to Trump, who is the opposite of those things. I'm surprised, because <laughs> people sometimes <laughs> like the thing. Yeah, well, because she's a nice, nice woman, and, and Ben's a nice guy. But 84% favorability, that's It's striking. not shocking at all. It's Iowa. And, and again, you know, in New Hampshire, Trump is way ahead. Mm -hmm. In South Carolina, I believe he's awesome. leading. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's, and as the rabbi here said, Iowa is not <laughs> predictive of much of anything. You're right about that. It hasn't been for a very long time on the Republican side. So, uh, yeah, I wouldn't, I wouldn't jump too quickly. Yet. He has said some controversial things, though. No, oh, not sh Trump. No, Carson. Mr. Oh, Carson. Yes. Ben gay for the I'm state, sorry. Carson. Yeah, you think I that's know. controversial? I'm just saying. I know, but the thing is, he's proven you can say outrageous things if you say them with dignity. <laughs> as opposed to Trump, who sometimes says some very smart things with very limited dignity and people tire of him quickly. And I think that's what we're watching here. So we had bombast and anger, mm -hmm. and it's now being overtaken by gentlemanliness and dignity. Who wins in that one? Too Gen early to tell. Yeah, okay. I, I think outrageous was being generous. <laughs> <laughs> I think you're right. Meanwhile, Trump has gotten himself into a little bit of an embarrassing situation when he tweeted, let's see the tweet. Word is that Ford Motor, because of my constant badgering at packed events, is going to cancel their deal to go to Mexico and stay in the U.S. He also tweeted, do you think I will get credit for keeping Ford the U.S.? Who cares? My supporters know the truth. I think what can be done as president. Ford responded with a release that said in part, and we quote, we decided to move the F-650 and F-750 medium duty trucks, I love those, to Ohio assembly in 2011, long before any candidates announced their intention to run for U.S. president. <sighs> this is a little embarrassing. Embarrassing? This, let me tell you something. And by the way, the Detroit Free Press auto reporter w knew about it in 2011, so he backed up Ford Motor Company. Okay. This is, folks, this is why I get crazy about Donald Trump. You say he's not a politician? That was the most politician-like thing you can do. Take credit for something that you had nothing to do with. <laughs> is it How you can support a guy who would do a thing like that, it's like, it's like, Third grade man. Is it being him by a politician or him just being unprepared, not knowing the facts? Well, I, which one's worse? I think I'm prepared, not knowing the facts. Um, well, no, you know, being I disingenuous. Mean, yeah, I, yeah. I, mean, I, I, I don't know. I mean, it's it's. <laughs> I think, ooh. But his failure to check his facts before he goes out in these tweets, which is really his way of speaking to the world, because he uses it as a press conference every time that he tweets. To, it's simple enough to check. It's not if like Hillary it would have Clinton been difficult. If Hillary Clinton did that, the, the, the conservative media would be stringing her up. Well, we are let's giving him a hard time right now. And let's put it in context. Al Gore invented the Internet. So there is a, there's a tendency for politicians to have a kind of grandiosity where yeah, they take credit for supposed everything. To be against, and the no, I completely agree. If we're going to hold him up as a non-politician, hold him up non-politician. Don't take credit for what you didn't do. Here's Shameful. what I don't see out of the Trump campaign that I thought we would because he keeps promising that he will surround himself with very smart people that have been very successful in life. And who's he surrounding himself with? I don't see surrogates. I don't see campaign staff that I would say, oh, that's a good guy to have and, on my and team. And you don't see people who are willing to do a little homework before he no. makes outrageous well, comments taking credit for Do you for think things? people are afraid to tell him what he doesn't want to hear? Absolutely. And I, I think he think surrounds people People with himself with people who aren't going to tell Not him. Like that's the for key. A president. Exactly. I, I think that the mark of excellence to him is that you only are near him if you tell him what he wants to hear. That's yeah. But right. well, Bill Rancic was a good winner of Apprentice. <laughs> <laughs> I think he's told he the was. staff. He did work for, for a bit. Yeah. You can be chief of staff. 
He probably, right? And he's quite a tasty dish, too. He's a good looking guy. My wife thinks so. It's what I'm told, anyway. Well, she likes you, so. Yeah, either way, one we're looking hopes. forward to the debate tomorrow night, and, and uh, certainly it's going to be one hell of a show. So, do you think Ben Carson will overtake Trump in the polls? It's already happened, but I think we mean in a more consistent Stay basis. Go to NewsmaxTV.com slash comments and let your voice be heard. Also, tomorrow night, catch Newsmax TV's post GOP debate coverage starting at 10 p.m., which features Sarah Palin, Dick Morris, Rick Unger, all good stuff. Stuff. Stick with us. More Daily Wrap in a moment. We have a budget agreement. Uh, this agreement will protect our economy and uh, reduces the deficit. Uh, the agreement isn't perfect by any means, but the alternative uh, was a clean debt ceiling increase without any additional support for our troops and without any entitlement reforms. So this is a good deal uh, for our troops, uh, for our taxpayers, and for the American people. As somebody who got a bipartisan agreement in a town uh, that isn't known for a lot of bipartisanship, you're going to see bricks flying from those uh, that don't like the fact that there's a bipartisan agreement. Well, there you have it. Bipartisan peace, love, and cooperation breaking out in the nation's capital. And just when you thought it couldn't be done, the congressional GOP leadership and the White House have come to terms on a two-year budget deal, a deal that will end the threat of another debt ceiling showdown until March of 2017. Additionally, the new budget, if approved by the Senate and the House, will lift the mandatory spending caps on defense and domestic spending imposed by the sequester while locking in cuts to Medicare and Social Security disability programs. No disability. While congressional leadership on both sides of the aisle appeared satisfied with the deal, so too is the White House, which released the following statement. It's a responsible agreement that is paid for in a balanced way by ensuring that hedge funds and private equity firms pay the taxes they owe and by cutting billions in wasteful spending. So guys, simple question, is this a good deal for the American public or not? Joe Concha. It's a surrender. It's a surrender. Yes. Yeah. Petrified of what? a government shutdown over a debt ceiling with the presidential election coming up, knowing what happened last time and how it turned off so many people. Even though they control the Senate and they control Congress, this was, in the eyes of many conservatives, a surrender. Is it a good or a bad deal? Well, I will I tell yet. you that as I spoke to a number of far right leaning conservatives coming in the door here at Newsmax today, they agree with you mm -hmm. very much so. But, Brad, you know, there's a lot of things in this deal that Republicans wanted. They wanted that change in Social yeah. Security disability to get the people who were cheating. They, they right. did get some of the cuts that they wanted. They did. And I, I don't think, it, I think it's a meh deal. It's not good. It's not bad. I think Paul Ryan is right. The process itself stinks. And it stinks for the reasons that Joe mentioned. This is about not what's good for the American public anymore. It's how each side can claim victory. Republicans get to say, you see, no shutdown. Don't be angry at us. And the Democrats can say to the president, you see, you can do whatever you want because now you have economic security through the end of your term. You know what, Heather? Brad brings up Paul Ryan and what he said today, which I thought was somewhat amazing because all he was really doing was kissing up to the, to the, the, the ones all the way on the right, the, the Tea Party caucus. Because let's face it, He's the big winner. He doesn't have, have to, to have deal, these right. problems until March of 2017. Well, the thing that I think is interesting is it's a deal. That's part of a deal is compromise, and nobody's supposed to be happy. We always say that about settlements. Right. If everybody walks right. away unhappy, it's a good settlement. Here, you had each side acquiescing somewhat, and I'm happy about the fact that our troops are getting more money, especially with all we'll be talking about a little bit later about what's going right. on with our troops. So I understand the frustration, especially on the right. I think that there that frustration is has been seething for a long time, and that's why we see some of the people in the polls. But I think ultimately it's a deal. Well, one of the people who's not so happy in the United States Congress is Republican Senator Jeff Sessions, who had this to say. I'm worried about how fast it's moving. I see no reason for that. Based on what I know now, it appears the president got whatever he wanted. Either way, the bottom line here is that government spending will be increased by $80 billion over a two-year period, and that doesn't include a $32 billion overseas contingency fund, which allows the administration to cover the costs of wars they may get into. That brings the total spending increase to $112 billion over two years. Now, considering that the two-year increase resulting from sequestration was only $63 billion, 
you wouldn't think that the deficit hawks are going to be very happy with this. And that leads to the question, what's going to happen now when this comes before the Congress? Can the Freedom Caucus, Heather, block this deal? I don't think so. I think that there are enough people, enough Republicans who don't want government shutdown, who don't, as Joe said, don't want to deal with the politics of it, and enough of the hawks who are happy about the spending on the troops. I think that all of that is going to be enough to carry the day. And Brad, there's something else going on here. The Democrats in the House are all going to vote for it because the White House supports it. That's right. So I don't, this is going to go forward, and I think actually the Sessions made a terrible mistake. If you want to argue against it based on deficit spending, that's at least a principal position. When you simply rant and rave, the president got everything he wanted, so that's a bad thing. That's exactly what I think the public is tired of. Stop playing party politics with our money. And yet, it's just not appropriate. And yet both sides seem to want to do it, Joe. You know, again, going back to Paul Ryan, who will likely be elected the next speaker that's tomorrow. Right. Mm-hmm. Tomorrow. He, He's already getting a pass from the Freedom Caucus. The very people he had to persuade to put him in there, the far right wingers, they are saying, yeah, we believe him when he says that he thinks this is a terrible process. We don't think he would have done this if he was in charge. But the good news is they won't have to find out until March of 2017. It's it's funny. It reminds me of when the Iran hostages were released on the morning Reagan was sworn into office. This was like, we got the budget deal the day before Ryan takes over and says, hey, my, this is Boehner's legacy, right. not mine. Right. So you're right. He, he gets a free pass. So why is he complaining, on. guys? This is the one thing I, I mean, just for Play show. politics. Which is for show. Well, first of all, yeah, it's a big thank you it's note. <laughs> and he wants to offer right. that up. Yeah. But I think he actually is, does have a point. The process is like lousy. It's not serving us well. He'll benefit from it, and that's fine or not. But so in the in the short time we have left, as I mentioned, tomorrow will probably be the last day of John Boehner's term as Speaker yeah. of the House. Does anybody want to say goodbye to him? Anybody have any nice parting words for Speaker Boehner? His short tear. game is great, and he's an excellent putter. <laughs> <laughs> Brad, I've it's getting that. close to Halloween, and he's orange, so that's probably oh, good. Oh. I'll shed a tear over him. Oh, okay. he shed many See, tears. Can I on a better note than that? Heather has a little <laughs> class. I wish him nothing but good luck. So is this a good deal we've been talking about for the nation, or has the Congress given in and allowed the national debt to further spiral out of control? We want to know what you think, and you can tell us at NewsmaxTV.com slash comments. Coming up, is Bernie Sanders playing the gender card? Stay with us. was going to give immunity to the only industry in America. Everybody else has to be accountable, but not the gun manufacturers. And we need to stand up and say enough of that. We're not going to let it continue. We're going to bring you all in on this, but Senator Sanders, you have to be able to respond. As a senator from a rural state, what I can tell Secretary Clinton, that all the shouting in the world is not going to do what I would hope all of us want and that is keep guns out of the hands of people who should not have those guns and end this horrible violence that we are seeing. And those words didn't sit too well with the former Secretary of State. I've been told to stop, and I quote, shouting about gun violence. Well, first of all, I'm not shouting. (laughs) It's just when women talk, some people think we're shouting. You're the one she's quoting, Senator Sanders. She is suggesting in public that you have a problem with women speaking out. Uh, All that I can say is I am very proud of my record on women's issues. I certainly do not have a problem with women speaking out. And I think what the secretary is doing there is taking words and misapplying them. I think that's the most pleasant and calm I've ever seen Bernie Sanders when speaking. <laughs> anyway, it seems like Hillary is playing the gender card here. Even Miko over at Morning Joe called Clinton's response pathetic. Heather Hansen, Mika, have a point? Hillary was shouting, first of all. She, she was, was shouting. Mm-hmm. And second of all, it is absolutely ridiculous. There are instances of sexual discrimination. There are instances of racism. You don't have to make them up. And this is her making one up. It's absolutely ridiculous. And I don't think it's going to do well for her with women. 
Does it bother you as a Democrat when she, when people say, hey, this is an election about outsiders and you've been an insider your whole life, and she says, I am an outsider. I could be the first woman president, and that makes me an outsider. Do you agree with that approach? I don't agree with it, but it doesn't bother me. It's just politics. I'll tell you, what bothers me is that she would say something so stupid that Bernie Sanders was being sexist in any way. To me, it's like what Melissa Harris Perry said over oh, the weekend. God. Oh, we'll be talking about that later. Oh, we are? Okay. <laughs> yeah. then we'll, we'll say that. But these are... These these are women saying really <laughs> stupid things, Hillary. Uh, it may not be a sexist thing he said, but what you said is just plain dumb. Brad, there is sexism here. It's Hillary's That's sexism. Right. It's <laughs> unbelievable That's that she would project out and assume some essential notion of women right. that women shout. So I want to be very clear. There is sexism here, and if anyone's a sexist, it's Hillary. I've heard well, women shout. Like yeah, me, exactly. But and they're men actually too. shouting and when they I shout. I don't care. Shout, don't shout. But her, that her brain could even go there but that's why is I'm either completely callous and lying, or really she is a sexist and she lives with these notions that it must be a it woman a thing. Or it's someone ridiculous. else wrote it for her. Yeah, I think that... I, I think that it was I, a good punchline, she yeah, thought. I, but, but it wasn't. She thought but it was wrong. horrible. It was no, probably written by a sexist man. Just I think <laughs> she has seen what playing the victim can do for her. It's what she does best. It's when her poll numbers go up. We saw it after the hearing, and she's trying to do it again, that the, the old man is picking on but the I woman. But I don't think she played the victim at the hearing. I think that she sure she, she held herself as a strong woman either. at the hearing. And I think that this is playing the victim when you haven't been victimized. She's going but to have... But to keep it all in context, this story's going to pass Absolutely. in about 24 hours. Absolutely. So. It'll go fast, but the insight that playing the victim counts with a certain segment of our culture, and mm -hmm. that's a very toxic deal, forgotten. is true. If yeah, I were Bernie, Bernie I'd be him. so angry right now because I saved her butt at that debate with to. the damn emails thing. Bro, it was the best to. line of the debate and it helped her. It was, no. He didn't mean to. I mean, this, this is what we've learned after. Was he drunk? What do you mean? No, he delivered the line that was written incorrectly. Uh -huh. He was supposed to do that in a very different way than the way that it came out. What, what was the goal then? If the goal was to kind of take a shot without taking a big shot. Okay. And it came out the supportive. wrong way. Yeah. And oh. it came out supportive. That we're not able to talk about the issues because because of the mistake you made with your email. I can't emails. tell you what the line was supposed to be. I don't know. But okay. I do know that the campaign had planned something different than what happened. Okay, so that was a planned line because so. he said it was organic. Yeah. That, well, well you know, it just... Well. Uh, I shouldn't be saying this, but still, she benefited from it. Absolutely. And she, here she is attacking him in, well, in the worst way possible. Well, get used to it. They are running against each other, you know. And it, it makes him inevitable. look better. I mean, that's, that's right. why I think he was so calm and smiley that's about exactly it. exactly right. Yeah. It he just has to sit look, back and say, right. actually, that's I'm right. the classy one in this exactly. race. You can like me, not like me, agree not, with me, not no, agree. No, it's not going to matter. I'm the classy guy. It makes no difference. In the latest polls, Hillary is crushing everybody. Well, everybody. There's like one other person, including Sanders. But she still has a likability issue with white women. That's interesting, huh? You would think she would do well there, Heather. Because it's so patronizing. I mean, it's well, ridiculous. Patronizing or patronizing? I say patronizing. Can you tomato, say patronizing, tomato? patronizing? Are we going to spend time? <laughs> yeah, I'm just curious. <laughs> but go ahead. I think ultimately women do not want you to make these things up. We have bigger right. problems, better problems, other things she could be talking about. She doesn't have to get into that. Mm. Either way, she'll be the nominee. Because Biden is getting Probably so, in. but that's to the Republicans' advantage because she's the one person who loses to almost everybody. Yeah. Rick, I think that what we're discounting, though, Bernie still has a shot. Taking because bets, babe. <laughs> Not taking bets. She, Bernie still has a shot, though, because all those Chafee and Web voters are probably going that's to That's true. They'll all go to him. So, do you think Bernie Sanders is sending a coded sexist message? Can't wait to hear about this. Let us know by going to NewsmaxTV.com slash comments and tell us what you think. Coming up next, boots on, this, on the ground in Syria. When I last spoke to this committee about our counter-ISIL campaign and its nine lines of essential military and non-military effort, I made three things clear about the military aspects. First, that we will deliver ISIL a lasting defeat. Second, that truly lasting success would require enabling capable, motivated local forces on the ground, recognizing that this will take time and new diplomatic energy. And third, that our strategy's execution can and must and will be strengthened. 
And welcome back to The Daily Wrap. The Obama administration is now acknowledging that the fight against ISIS has not gone as well as they had hoped for, and they're now preparing to make changes in their approach to the mission. Appearing today on Capitol Hill, Secretary of Defense Ash Carter promised a, quote, higher and heavier rate of strikes in the air campaign against ISIS targets, while Joint Chiefs Chairman Joseph Dunford Jr. confirmed that, quote, again, no one is satisfied with our progress to date. As a result of the lack of measurable success, the White House is now actively considering moving more U.S. troops closer to the front lines of the battle against ISIS in both Iraq and Syria. Are we now to effectively put boots on the ground in this war against ISIS where there had been no previous commitment to do so. Brad, were we, is this getting a little dangerous? It's getting a little bit, more than a little bit dangerous. This is real drift and mission drift, and there's exactly one effective fighting force on the ground against ISIS, and that's the Kurds. We're going to have to decide, is the goal to defeat ISIS and not worry about what comes next, or try and re-engineer the entire region? The first one is a doable. The second one, there is no track record of success, and we are going to get ourselves a world of pain if we think we're going to remanufacture that region. Right. Well, I think that's reasonable. Heather, you know, there's a natural tendency when you hear about U.S. troops moving closer to the front lines to go, uh-oh. But as somebody who was fairly supportive of boots on the ground early on right. in the fight right. against ISIS, right. I'm not troubled by this. Do you think I should be? No, I'm not troubled by it either because I mean, looking back, we were all, I think, supportive of the idea of boots on the ground when ISIS was super, super actioned up doing all kinds of things that had us worried. But I think that the bigger issue is to remember that these are, we're talking about special ops. We're not talking about, you know, sending right. a bunch of our boys in, at least now. And I think that many of us believe that special ops may be the right people to do it. But isn't it usually special ops go first, followed by our boys, as you put it? I, I don't know that that's going to, I mean, listen, I, I don't know what the, the overall plan right. is going to be, but it seems as though right now, I, I have a lot of respect for Ash Carter. I think that he has been very, very thoughtful in this. He's interviewed a lot of the people. He's traveled around to get a sense of it. And I think that um, something has to happen because they're not a JV team. They're not a JV team indeed. Well, the new moves come following the Obama administration's decision to end the training program whereby we were supposed to be training serious fighters to take on ISIS for us. That, of course, would be the same training program where we spent some $500 million to produce just four or five soldiers actively fighting against ISIS. You heard that right if it's the first time you're hearing it. Yet, according to Senator John McCain, that program would not have failed had the president heeded his advice and not put so many limitations on the effort of those Syrian trained soldiers. From the start, the administration said the fighters in this program could only fight ISIL, not Assad's forces which have slaughtered and displaced exponentially more Syrians than ISIL has. In addition, the administration made no commitment until only recently to provide these forces with any meaningful military support once they returned to Syria. After millions of dollars and months of effort, the program failed to come anywhere close to the department's original expectations. Rather than fixing the problem, the president suspended it. But this is tantamount to killing the program because it's destroying what little trust our Syrian partners have left in us, to say nothing of allies like Turkey and Jordan, which invested their own money and prestige in this program. Joe, as I understand it, what's bothering Senator McCain was that, as originally created this training program, was only going to let these Syrian soldiers battle with ISIS. They could have no involvement with going against the Assad government. Mm -hmm. So what, what the senator pointed out was, well, what are they supposed to do if the Assad government comes after them? I take his point, but you know what? That doesn't explain how you can spend a half a billion dollars and only train four or five soldiers. A hundred million per soldier, yeah. right? Uh, as far as boots on the ground, 55% of Americans, Pew poll, now says that uh, they, they support that. And I think the administration is hearing that, saying, you know what, there's not going to be the backlash that people think there is. They know that this is uh, Hitler's uh, Nazi Germany all over again in terms of this caliphate, this evil caliphate. They see the beheadings. They see the horrible things they're doing. They see the threat it could do to the U.S. homeland. It's the right decision, Rick. Okay. Is the administration making the right move, stepping up the airstrikes against ISIS and bringing U.S. troops closer to the 
reaction. Go to NewsmaxTV.com slash comments to tell us what you're thinking, and maybe we'll read your comments on the air, which is exactly what we will be doing when we return, because it's time for viewer comments. Stay with us. All right, let's read some of your viewer comments. First up, we have some thoughts on our segment from yesterday regarding income inequality. Regarding that topic, Rashawn writes, income and equality are just another made up non-issue by liberals to make rich people feel guilty. I'm middle class and sick of class envy from the government and media. This is still America. Put in the work and get to a place you want to be in life like you are, Rick Unger. Are you kidding me? I can't even believe you said that, Rashawn. People do put in the work and they're living in a van. Fran writes... Um, can we talk about that for a yeah, second? Yeah, we can. We did this last night. I That's know we did. That's just an absolutely outrageous statement I'm she made. So, I'm I sorry. still don't buy what's going on. They're making 19 it, an hour. It's happening. I'm sorry. Do the math. 19 an hour. Okay. What does that work out to? That makes out to about uh, at eight hours it's a day. It's under $30,000 a year. It, you try and live in America today on less than $30,000 a year. I think you can get a studio or something, a, though. What do you do if you have a family of three or four people? You all going to live in the They're all in the van. It's just him and his wife. Yeah, but what, I'm talking about 51% of working Americans. I understand They're that. not just him and his wife. What do you do if you have kids? There's you put something them all else the going on there. There's nothing I'm else sorry, going on when, there. You you're making 19 an hour. You can afford an apartment somewhere. Okay, well, we'll let the fact speaker, we'll let you speak. Okay, very good. Fran writes, <laughs> the economy can be put right at the feet of Obama and the progressives. I have never seen this country so low. People can't pay their bills. We are in bad shape. Wake up, Rick. I'm awake. I know exactly what kind of shape we're in. You can blame Obama if you want, but that ain't the problem. 94 million people are still out of work. I understand that. People say I we don't argue that. enough. I think it's more interesting than we do. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe it's not. <laughs> Patty writes, although there is not only one reason why hard-working citizens are not able to make ends meet. I was taken aback when Rick said, hopefully young folks can create jobs and pay people a fair or a living wage. Rick suffers from the same old progressive amnesia where they forget that wages are paid for a job according to the level of skill needed to do the job. Defend yourself. Easily. I mean, yes, wages are paid depending on skill level. Mm -hmm. But that means, should we still be paying the same wage we were paying in 1920 if you still have the same skill level? Because because let me tell you something, the cost of living has gone up dramatically since then. Look at the charts we provided you with. Cost of living keeps going up, wages stay stagnant. For the identical job, your point does not fly. Okay, read but the Jeff writes, here's an idea, work hard and make your own future. This thought of entitlement by progressives that people deserve a high salary regardless of skill or education is baloney. You don't deserve 15 bucks an hour to flip burgers. Maybe our next president can enforce the immigration laws to keep cheap labor from Mexico and elsewhere from taking good paying blue collar jobs from Americans. You know what? I actually buy your last point because a lot of those people are taking the jobs. However, they're not good paying blue collar jobs. That's the problem. Let me say it again. 51% of working, underline working Americans are hovering just above the poverty line. Let's open it up to everybody, shall we? Look, first of all, talk about who deserves what when you're arguing for a market economy is a little bit funny. I don't know who deserves what. I do know that far more important to me than income inequality is lack of mobility. And if we're in a place where hard work doesn't allow you to move up, Thank you. that kills hope. Whatever the economic response is, if hope dies, democracy dies. Thank That's what we've got very to nice. Heather, how much is this an education problem? I was though? just going to say, it's, it's education. Education leads to mobility. I think that that is a big part of the problem that we have to fix <laughs> for not, across the country. It's not that simple. It will create more skilled jobs, right. which is great. Wh which but are you're paid always, at a higher wage. Yes, it will, but you always need unskilled workers in any country. Well, no doubt. And that's what we're talking about, how those people can live on what they're being paid. And by the way, commenter, the word entitlements never entered into this conversation. I'm talking about with people who work a 40-hour hard week are not being paid enough. His name isn't commenter, it's Jeff. I forgot his <laughs> name. I apologize, Jeff. 
we have time for one more, why not? We received a couple of comments on our discussion about Donald Trump bringing up Ben Carson's religion. Ray says, we agree with Trump. It is important that we know our president's religion. Fascinating. I just thought it was a ridiculous argument. Yeah, I, I don't really care what their religions are, but, you know. Okay, very good. And if you want to weigh in on any of the issues we talk about here on the show, be sure to go to NewsmaxTV.com slash comments. As you see, we read some of them, the thousands on the air. Maybe you'll be a lucky one. Up next, it's time for yay or nay. But first, Rick, you have a special we offer for do, our Joe. audience. Indeed, we have the shocking new book, mm -hmm. Unlikable, The Problem with Hillary by author Edward Klein. It's already skyrocketed to the top of the bestseller list, and it's probably the most powerful expose on Hillary ever written. In Unlikable, author Ed Klein offers a stunning, powerful expose of Hillary Clinton and her race for the White House. With unprecedented access, Klein meticulously recreates conversations and details of Hillary Clinton's behind-the-scenes plotting. Klein also reveals the angry rivalry between Hillary and Barack Obama. Unlikable retails for $29.95, but now you can get it with our free offer. Get this almost $30 value absolutely free. Just go online to Newsmax.com slash Klein or call toll free at 1-800-850-8749. With 2016 election fast approaching, you need to get unlikable and be armed with the truth about Hillary. Check out our incredible offer right now. Welcome back to Daily Wrap. It's time for yay or nay. First up, MSNBC host. Her name is Melissa Harris Perry. Took offense to a guest use of the term hard work on her show, likely none of you saw live, arguing that it diminished the experience of slaves. The lunacy all started when conservative guest Alfonso Aguilar argued, and we quote, if there's somebody who is a hard worker when he goes to Washington, it's Paul Ryan. Apparently the host wasn't a fan of her guest's word choice. Okay, so basically what Ms. Harris Perry said <laughs> was that hard worker related back to slaves. Oh, do we have it? Yeah. Let's play it. Al Alfonso, I feel you, but, but I just want to I, I pause on one thing, because I, I don't disagree with you that I actually think Mr. Ryan is a great choice for this role, but I want us to be super careful when we use the language hard worker, because, I mean, I actually keep um, an image of um, folks working in cotton fields on my mm -hmm. office wall, because it is a reminder about what hard work looks like. So I feel you that he's a hard worker, I, I do, but in the context of relative privilege, and I just want to point out that when you talk about work, work-life balance and being a hard worker, the moms who Melissa, don't have health care, who are working I, I, on, the, I mean, I understand I, the, that. But, but we don't but call we, them hard workers. We call them failures. We call them people who are sucking no, off no, the system. No, no. Wow. I was immersed in that. <laughs> <laughs> Your yay or nay question, Brad Hirschfield. How does this woman have a show on national television? I, that is bat crap crazy. That's the <laughs> only thing I can say. That's that craptastic. That is, that is insane. That, but we got an I feel you, we got a privilege, and then we got that revisionist garbage. It's insane. And actually, if you, if you take a principled progressive position, uh -huh. that should be an embarrassment. Yes. How did that poor guest keep a straight face? Yeah. You see the look he in his was face? Like, oh my he had gosh, like the Hillary I bug eyes at one point, like Absolutely. he's not really saying this. It's my goodness. Just horrible. I tell you what, Melissa, you need help. Look, every, I know everybody on this panel, and you know what? Every single one of us is a hard worker. And you know what? I know the difference between what we do and heavy lifting. How do I know it? Because I did heavy lifting for quite a long period of time, and I was a hard worker then. You need help. That is the dumbest thing I've ever heard, and shame on MSNBC for having you on their air. Yeah, we'll have to move on after that. That was definitive. I'd love to hear what uh, heavy lifting you've I done. I worked in the steel mills every summer all through college. Did you really? You bet. Do we have photos? 
No. <laughs> My Don't hair worry. was down to here. Oh, really? Don't worry. We'll make up some. Anyway, <laughs> next up, fun. move over, because the Hillary Clinton campaign, move over Donald Trump, that is, Hillary Clinton campaign has actually released Halloween costumes for you to go on on Saturday. Yep, it's coming up. And no, it's not Hillary Clinton as a witch or Hillary Clinton as the Bride of Frankenstein. Oh, no. It's just clothing that the Clintons have worn over the years. Check out these outfits. Do we have them? I believe we do. Yep, so there's uh, Hillary. That's uh, one, one outfit you could go as. Do we actually have what you have to have to have the costume? That's a nice one there. She almost looks like uh, Breakfast at Tiffany's. Who played that? Or you could even go as Hillary checking out her Blackberry. Look at that. You just have two guys standing behind you with, with shades on. I think on. she was testifying in the old Benghazi committee there. Yeah, uh, maybe. So are you going to go as Hillary is the question? Absolutely not. Okay. Anything but. Uh, all I know is, is that when you are that famous and that important that they're doing things like that for Halloween, you're probably going to be president of the United States. Wow, you should stick and buy it. Can't, 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 can't let go of that one. Nominee, yes, is what president. it is. Let's see. Is okay. what it is. Finally tonight, former heavyweight champ Mike Tyson has given one presidential candidate his biggest endorsement yet. That's right. Iron Mike is throwing his weight behind Donald Trump for president. During an interview with Huffington Post Live, Tyson shared his thoughts on the GOP frontrunner as well as why he has the support. We have it up on the screen. He says, you should be president of the United States. Yeah, hell yeah. Big time. <laughs> why wouldn't anyone like that? A guy that came from where he was from, not even bother doing my Tyson invitation, doing what he's doing in that field, and now this is where he's at. You know what that means? Let's discuss what it means. Is this just Tyson's way of being chosen for Celebrity Apprentice in 2024 when Trump leaves office? Uh, I always listen to Mike Tyson. I'm sold. All right, done. <laughs> Heather? Yeah, it must be. What else? <laughs> Just do? watch his ears. That's all that's I'll say. Happen. Watch the ears. Ah, good point. Evander Holyfield reference. And that's our show for tonight. Remember, tomorrow night, 10 p.m., post-debate coverage with Sarah Palin, Dick Morris, and Rick. Good night. <laughs>